Grace, it's my, um, my pleasure just to ha have a chance to talk to you a little bit about some of the, the tools and technologies that at ProMune, I guess, have been alluded to already by a number of different speakers. Um, and also just to present some data to you from um, a number of different case studies that uh, we've carried out within the company. And as we go through this, I think it's very clear that, as we've already um, spoken about, there's so many, you know, as any of these assays, they tend to raise a lot of questions um, as well as answering them. And th as I think we're also going to be continuing to discuss, the issues of um, benchmarking results against standards uh, will also be a, a very key, key question. So it's, well, thanks, Bonnie, for really raising that as a, as a question. Um, I won't spend too much time on this sort of introductory slide, as uh, many of you will be acutely aware of some of these things. And obviously, any... Any cartoon is an oversimplification of the, um, the biology of it. But uh, essentially, um, a biologic molecule, when it's uh, taken up by an antigen-presenting cell, is naturally processed and presented. And um, components of that protein are then presented in the context of MHC molecules. So here, an MHC class 2 presenting peptides to uh, a CD4-positive helper T cell. And it's this specific interaction, this recognition of a linear T cell epitope in the context of MHC by a, a helper T cell, um, which can then activate the immune response. <coughs> of course, there's quite a lot of things that really complicate this. It's not as simple as that. But ultimately, when activation does occur, proliferation happens, cytokines are produced. And ultimately, this can then go on to, to provide help uh, to B cells. And B cells recognizing um, the biologic as well through the uh, surface Ig receptors um, will then become activated and themselves produce anti-drug antibodies targeting the, the therapeutic. So there are a number of ways that we can try and understand and, um, what's going on in the system. And one of such is our, um, our technologies, which on the whole focus on this interaction between T cell receptor and MHC peptide complex. So T cells by themselves aren't a, a driver of, of uh, are kind of a key driver of immunogenicity. I can't speak immunogenicity. Um, but by themselves aren't the sole cause. Of course, you do need that, uh, the B cells to then produce anti-drug antibodies, which ultimately can be one of the problems. So immunogenicity effects are numerous. We can have lo loss of efficacy, altered pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and also potential cross-reactive problems, which, um, if we, of course, we can address them in uh, preclinical development, it is going to be a good thing, but if it, it is more complicated than that. Um, I'm also going to be talking about some of our other technologies to address the specificity of antibodies um, through our ProRay Ultra technology at the end of the talk. So one of the things that came out of the meeting we discussed last year was very much um, the issue of or the, uh, the concept of quality by design. And that if we can have approaches which really address the questions of immunogenicity from those early stages, it can help us make the, the right decisions as we go through development processes. Um, and lead ranking and selection, of course, is one of those, one of those approaches which many of you may be aware, uh, involved in at the moment. So to do that, of course, we can measure aspects such as T cell epitope content, um, not just the actual specificity of the epitopes, but maybe how many epitopes there are, where they actually exist, how they maybe even correlate to aggregation and interesting questions that, like that we've been uh, hearing about earlier. Um, also, maybe what's the population impact of these, these T cell epitopes? By that, I mean in many therapeutic areas that we're working in, there is actually associations of HLA types. So in autoimmunity, for example, um, specific HLA types are associated with those patients. And if it turns out that the therapeutic that we're developing uh, unwittingly has epitopes designed into that which bind preferentially to those HLA types, then of course we're increasing the risks of unwanted immune responses. Again, that's just one risk factor to take into account. Lead optimization, maybe we've already taken our, our molecule through development and we just want to try and improve it and think about deimmunization strategies, but uh, at the same time maintaining efficacy issues. Um, patients uh, receiving therapeutics, we may also want to identify specific epitopes in those patients that are receiving therapeutics for clinical immune monitoring. And that's something which at this stage really on the T cell epitope level um, is not really being carried out. And I think that's something where Access to clinical material is a real limitation and something which potentially as we go forward is something that needs to be addressed. And overall, all this sort of information that can be identified through looking at T cell epitopes, we believe strongly can also um, strengthen the regulatory position. It can add value to the product as it's going through uh, um, the pipeline. And overall, 
supports this quality by design, so really uh, integrating it into the beginning parts of the development process. So T-cell epitopes are complicated. Um, it's not just a matter of whether this peptide can bind to an MHC molecule, as indicated by this MHC peptide binding part of my PI, my Venn diagram, but also um, whether this peptide, in fact, can be processed in the first place. Can our, our epitopes be seen by the immune system? So that has to happen. The peptide then has to bind to the MHC. And then, of course, we actually have to have an avid interaction between the T-cell receptor and the MHC peptide complex, which goes on to be functional and um, can then cause an immune response. So at ProImmune, what we've decided to, to develop, really, is an integrated platform which is addresses a number of these, these different issues through a number of different uh, technologies. Um, none of them individually will, will solve the world's problems, but uh, together and uh, looking at these in an integrated approach can really help us understand a little bit about some of those issues associated with um, immunogenicity from a T cell epitope level. So the first of all, um, I'm going to be talking about our antigen processing assays, which we call ProPresent. So these are um, an assays where we, we use dendritic cells that are loaded with a therapeutic of interest and we then identify peptides that are naturally processed and presented in the context of MHC molecules. So this takes into account um, antigen processing questions, of course also takes into account um, post-translational modifications, and anything that changes the mass of this peptide sequence could be picked up by mass spectrometry. T-cell functional <coughs> assays such as our naive T-cell um, PBMC assays, which typically use overlapping peptides or individual peptides to assess proliferation, or whole protein dendritic cell T cell assays are very useful in understanding what the ultimate functional response of those peptide sequences are. So just because a peptide is, is recognized or sorry, is presented by an MHC molecule doesn't make it, of course, a, a functional epitope. And that's where these sorts of assays can, can add value. And then um, we're also going to be talking about our MHC peptide binding assays. And we've heard about um, the high throughput advantages and low cost of in silico, um, but also the the limitations of in silico and how that really correlates to maybe um, a higher number of false negatives or false positives than we would expect or would like to see. So these are assays where we can actually confirm the HLA restriction of peptides that we're seeing binding in these assays and are causing a functional response in these assays as well. So together, this information can be used to identify and rank uh, naturally processed epitopes. And we can also compare a number of different attributes such as um, whole protein antigenicity. And with that information can then go on and hopefully make some um, intelligent uh, decisions based on some data, but also taking into account all the other aspects that are um, involved in your own internal programs. So the case that I'm going to be talking about is Humira, adalimumab, um, which, as many of you know, and doesn't really need much introduction, has been spoken about already quite a bit this morning, uh, used in a number of different indications of autoimmune disease, including rheumatoid arthritis. And it's a... Uh, uh, fully human technology generated by phage display. It's an IgG1 antibody. And um, with respect to immunogenicity, um, I guess we've heard different figures. This is probably now a bit more maybe conservative from what Manaj was saying. But um, between 5 and 20, or as, as we've heard, even up to 35% of patients developing um, neutralizing antibodies, um, again, depending on the indication. But of course, that doesn't necessarily correlate into um, clinical outcome. So the aim of our project was to identify and characterize these individual epitopes of Humira that are naturally processed and presented. So to do that, we use our technology called ProPresent, which we've developed and based it on healthy um, dendritic cells that derive from healthy donors. And what this does, it directly measures um, peptides that are presented by MHC molecules on the surface of dendritic cells that have been cultured with the therapeutic of interest. And then using tandem mass spectrometry, we can then sequence those individual peptides and characterize them. So clearly, one of the things that um, mass spec assays have been used, of course, for, for many years, but what's really changed the game in this area is the sensitivity of the instruments available. And it's a really nice marriage now between proteomics and immunology, because it means that we can then address some of these key issues, which um, in the past have been very, very difficult to, to even get answers to. So we can identify de novo peptides that are, are presented from our molecule of interest. Introducing point mutations may, of course, then affect whether that peptide ultimately is even presented. So those sorts of questions can also be addressed in this assay. Um, we can assess the impact of, maybe, uh, for example, allelic variants of proteins. We've talked about factor eight and how that can also influence things. And um, we also have a recent publication, which was published by Sanofi Pasteur, um, in Journal of Clinical, 
Journal of Clinical Immunology if people want to have a, a reference to that. Um, I should also put this into the context that although the case study that I'm going to be talking about is carried out um, using our standard service, which uses a, a, a healthy dendritic cells derived from healthy donors, we can also, um, this assay is very flexible and we can also use it to analyse um, antigen presenting cells from preclinical models, for example. We can look at MHG class 1 and MHG class 2. We can look at DR, DP or DQ. So there are many different um, subtle questions that, that this system can be used to, to address in different ways. But what I'm going to be talking about today is our, our sort of standard service. So just to represent this pictorially in a sort of very simple cartoon, um, our, our customers provide us with some protein. And uh, what we then do is we take dendritic cells that are derived from our pro-immune biobank. And our donors are sourced from the UK. They're all HLA typed. So we can actually um, pick our donors to represent the sort of global distribution of HLA types. Um, we then do a monocyte-derived dendritic cell culture. So from these healthy PBMC donors, we derive monocyte-derived dendritic cells. Um, a fair number of cells are required for this kind of assay when we're doing the, the DC generation. And, um, and so that again, that for maybe discussion later it is a point where we maybe want to look at more uh, clinical samples and how do we do that in, in practice because okay, technology moves on and there may be ways that we can look at that but it would also be very interesting to discuss that with you guys as to how you may see that evolving particularly through approaches like leukophoresis rather than just asking a poor patient to give a pint of blood because we probably need about 200 300 mils of, of blood from a patient which isn't always easy um, so the dendritic cells are, are cultured and matured and basically the peptides are naturally processed and presented in the context of MHC and after that time frame, the dendritic cell is lysed and we carry out an immunoprecipitation step to isolate the MHC class of interest. In this case, for the Humira case study, is HLA-DR. So we pull down these um, HLA-DR alleles with a peptide, elute the, sequence, elute the peptides, and then they run through a tandem mass spectrometer to identify the actual sequences that are presented. The donors that we, we use, as I say, are, are of a broad distribution with regards to HLA type. Um, the science of HLA picking is still very sort of in its infancy, so we know what the HLA types are, but in practice the data sets available for saying what is a broad HLA distribution is still quite difficult. But um, with the fact that different HLA types have um, associations and are pulled along with each other with regards to DQ and, and DP being associated with different DRs, you tend to get a broad distribution of different alleles. And so in red here, this is the, um, the global frequency of these different alleles and in blue are the frequency of the donors that we picked out for this particular study. So in this study we picked out 10 donors. Um, there's not really a limit to the number of donors we can look at. Look at. It's, of course it's just a matter of the cost involved but for a typical study that would be between 10 and 20 donors that we would look at. Um, and so having isolated those particular donors we then do quite a lot of QC steps to carry out this assay. So the first thing is as I mentioned we, we carry out high resolution HLA typing. Um, as you would expect, we also check the viability and um, the phenotype of the cells that we're generating by flow. We measure the quantity of MHC recovered and also the amount of peptide that's recovered, as well as the typical number of peptides that we see overall um, from the proteins that have been loaded. Um, expression markers that we may look at in flow are obviously class 2 itself, um, CD86, DC sign, as well as a number of other cell surface markers just to check the phenotype of the dendritic cells. And um, then what our client does need to do is to tell us the protein sequence. So what we do is that we, we load the, the protein sequence into our database and in addition to that we add in, um, in addition to the protein sequence, it's added into the whole human protein database. So what we're doing is any sequences that have been identified through mass spec, we're then matching it against the whole library of human sequences plus the therapeutic protein as well. And we're using standard proteomic analysis and have a greater than 95% confidence-based exclusion search. That means that the, the chance um, of these peptides coming up completely at random uh, is obviously less than that. Um, we have a less than 1% false discovery rate. So um, as well as putting in your protein sequence into the human database and looking at it, we actually repeat the whole process with a reversed or randomized um, sequence. And the chance that your, the peptides that have been identified through this process are the same, are less than 1%. And these are accepted standard journal acceptance criteria for these sorts of um, assays. The peptides that we see bound to MHC class 2 are, as you would expect, according to the literature, um, typically between um, anything between 9, 10 amino acids up to 
15 to 20 amino acids. But typically, we see this sort of maximum around 15 amino acids. That's the sort of the, the distribu distribution maximum. We also look at endogenous proteins. So the majority of peptides that are presented in MHC class 2 are going to be your internal um, endogenous proteins that are expressed by the dendritic cell. And so we have a number of a number of proteins which we're automatically analyzing. And if a donor doesn't express a panel of these um, proteins, so three out of six, then they're excluded from the analysis. So we'll only include donors in the search which pass uh, a number of different quite stringent acceptance criteria. Having identified the peptides as well, we also provide a sort of a, a service of, of anchor matching uh, against the HLA types, the donors. So we're not using homozygous donors, that's at one point to make clear. So these donors, of course, will express, if you're looking at DR, two different DRs, DR1, DR2, for example. And um, it, it does mean that, of course, there is a chance that the peptide will be either presented by one or the other. And the immunoprecipitation that we're carrying out is pan-DR. So we are pulling out peptides that could be bound to both. So to confirm the HLA restriction of those peptides, we can do binding assays. Um, but if you were just having this service alone, then we also provide Using, based on the literature, we would tell you what we think is the most likely um, HLA restriction of the peptides that have been identified. So to cut a very long story short, um, uh, and also <laughs> in a very small table, we have here um, a summary of these four sequences which were identified from Humira. Now we've analysed the variable, um, uh, variable light and, and heavy chain We've not looked at the constant domain um, as yet. That's something that's a work in progress. And what we're looking at here is the full, full length sequence. What we identified, this is a, sort of a summary of the data, and um, the report, the sample report of this data is available to anyone who is interested, so you can have a look at the raw data, is that we typically see nested sequences because not just a single peptide is identified, but typically nested sets of a particular region. So this is the full length sequences is identified from a number of different regions. So here we have the position. We have one peptide here from the light chain and three peptides from the variable heavy chain. Um, this is the HLA types of the donors in which these particular peptides were identified. So this particular peptide from the light chain is, um, was identified from donors that were DR1, DR3, and DR401 and DR403 DR um, allotypes. Um, this particular peptide, as you can see, is, is a relatively promiscuous peptide that actually um, was identified in quite a range of different HLA alleles, whereas some peptides are quite um, defined and, and only restricted to the particular alleles that we're looking at here, so just DR4. Um, at the end here, we're looking at the likely allele associations based on known anchor residues. So given the fact that this particular peptide, WNS, is in a donor that's DR1 and DR403, when we look at the, the likely anchor residues, it seems that um, this restriction is actually DR1, but that ne ultimately needs to then be confirmed experimentally. So we're going to focus our, our, our attention on this particular peptide here, DNAK, just to give you a bit of a story. Um, so just bear that one in mind for the moment. If we have a look at those um, sequences that are identified and we just map them, they typically overlap with CDR regions, but not exclusively. So there is one peptide here which is between um, CDR2 and 3 of the heavy chain. Um, and this particular peptide here on the light chain overlaps the CDR2. Um, so these four unique sequences were identified by, by ProPresent, and no Humira peptides were obviously identified in unloaded controls or cells loaded with an isotype matched um, uh, antibody as well. And these sequences hadn't been previously described in the literature, but of course then um, it's something which is relatively novel. So the next question is, do these peptides that are, are presented and bound to MHC that have been identified by mass spec, are they functional T cell epitopes? And of course, what, we're, what we saw there were only four overlap or four peptides that were identified. When we've looked at other proteins, you do get quite a variety of numbers of peptides that are presented. Um, for example, KLH, which is a very large protein and typically induces a very strong naive T cell response, we identified 20 peptides from that panel. And other proteins, you can see um, maybe just one or two peptides. So Humira um, is probably in, in, in the ballpark of what we were expecting to see. So to confirm the functional T cell epitopes, we carry out our um, PBMC proliferation assays. And these are 
from a panel of healthy donors, we typically use between 40 and 50 donors, depending on the project. And um, the donors are from our biobank, and they're all CD8 depleted, so we're just focusing on, on CD4 positive T cell responses. Again, we select the donors to get a broad HLA distribution. And this particular study was carried out, rather than just using those peptides identified in ProPresent, was carried out with the full overlapping set from the variable domain of um, Humira from the heavy and light chain. And our strategy here would be to use 15 mer sequences offset by three amino acids, so overlapping by 12 amino acids. Of course, there are limitations to these assays where by, by nature because you're just identifying 15 mer sequences and walking through, but it does uh, allow you very sensitively to, to map regions which are causing um, immune responses in vitro, so T cell proliferation in vitro. So we, we co-culture these PBMCs with uh, individual peptides, high purity peptides, 95% pure, and we typically do a seven-day proliferation assay using um, CFSE. So CFSE is an intracellular dye, which is fluorescent, and you stain your PBMCs with this dye and incubate it with the peptides. And when there's a proliferative response, the dye gets equally divided between the daughter cells once they've proliferated. And so what you can then do is measure those cell responses by flow cytometry. And you can then measure um, the division index. So what you're typically seeing in an unstimulated control are cells here which are CFSE positive and CD4 positive as well in, in this gate. So these are cells which are, are stained with CFSE but haven't proliferated. There are some cells in this gate A because there's natural turnover, of course, of the cells, but that's what you'd expect to see. And then with our test peptide, we, um, in this case, is a, a strong response. We see cells which have proliferated going from uh, gate D to gate C. Now, it is an evolving field, and one of the things that we're always striving to do is to try and um, analyze the data and present the data in the best possible way. So Bonnie's been um, presenting data where we've analyzed um, T cell responses with cell division index, which was um, the proportion of cells which are divided in your test molecule over the cells which hadn't divided, um, divided by the unstimulated control, same conditions. Um, what we're now kind of more moving towards is actually just rather than a division and getting a cell division index is actually um, a subtraction. So you're actually uh, taking the percentage of cells proliferating to the peptide minus the proliferating cells that have um, proliferated in with the unstimulated control. Again, for discussion, and it, it is obviously quite a lot of statistics and maths involved. Um, but we can determine a significant response um, by t-test and also um, Typically, we, we use a, a threshold of two standard errors of the mean above, above background. But there are many ways that these data can be analyzed, and there isn't really, um, yeah, we're kind of open to sort of more discussion in, in that particular, particular space. So what we're looking at here for the data with Humira is the overlapping peptides on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we here we have percentage antigenicity. So in short, each color is a different donor that responds significantly. And you can see some donors, such as this red donor, are what we would call hyper-responsive. So they're actually proliferating in, in many of the different peptides. Um, and what you can also see are particular regions, if I go to the next, there, where you can actually map out the CDL1, 2, and 3 from the heavy chain. We can see that these particular peptides are um, causing us the sort of strongest in vitro T cell response. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven donors responding significantly to that one particular peptide. So using this information, you can identify hotspots in your protein. And if you weren't doing the antigen presentation assay and you're just using overlapping sequences, you can then um, at least have a tool to pinpoint which regions are causing this in vitro proliferation. But what I want to do now is actually just highlight this particular sequence here, which is on the um, beginning of the CDR3. And this sequence actually was the sequence identified through the mass spec technology, the ProPresent. Um, that, that was the 15 mode that's in blue, but then with the full length sequence that we identified through the mass spec, we have this DNAKN sequence on the N terminus as well. So this is actually the full length sequence which we know um, is, is causing this uh, functional response in vitro. So now that we know that this, this area actually is potentially causing an immune response, then what about the HLA restriction? So we know that the donors involved, this is quite a promiscuous peptide, and we know that the donors um, are quite broad in HLA distribution. And based on the alleles that we predict to bind, 
we kind of have a stab based on the literature that they're DR1, 1302, 401, and 0301. But what is re what's really going on when you actually think about these peptides binding to different MHC types? To really understand what this impact might be, particularly in the context of autoimmune diseases where you have these associations, it may be quite important to really understand what the HLA restriction is rather than a bit of hand-waving. So to do that, we would deploy our reveal peptide binding assays. Um, so these are high-throughput physical assays which use recombinant MHC molecules to identify which peptides bind to different, uh, different um, allele types. We, it, it is a high, truly high-throughput system, so we're capable of screening many hundreds and thousands of peptides against a very large panel of different HLA types. Um, in silico approaches are typically um, limited by the number of alleles that you can actually use. They deploy major allele um, subtypes, um, but in essence, the actual individual subtle differences between HLA types, you, you can't really use them in high prediction using um, in silico because the modeling uh, technology is just not there yet. So this allows you to access key questions as to which peptides combine to different HLA types very precisely. And we actually have the broadest coverage of <coughs> DR, DP, and DQ alleles from any, any provider, which gives, on average, about a, a greater than 90% global coverage. Um, and of course, you can also use this technology to identify um, the effects of introducing point mutations, whether that limits MHC peptide binding or even enhances it in the context of vaccine development, which is just one point. I mean, it is just MHC peptide binding. It's not about the function. It's not about the presentation. But it can be used to really address those, those questions. So the principle of the assay is relatively simple. It's an immunoassay, which uses recombinant MHC, as I mentioned. And for each different MHC <coughs> molecule, we incubate the peptide of interest to the MHC, and we use a conformational antibody, which then binds only when there's peptide bound in the groove of the MHC. And when the peptide is bound to the groove, we can then analyze signal, which is measured in a quantitative manner. For each different MHC allele, we have um, control peptides, which have been characterized as, as high binders to those particular MHC molecules. Um, the readout isn't SPR, so it's not Biocore. Um, it's an amino assay which measures the quantity of MHC peptide complex present. Nevertheless, we're able to do um, some kinetic analysis depending on the different alleles we're looking at. But our standard assay, um, we have what we call a, a binding assay, which looks at essentially at one time point how much complex is present with individual peptides. And then we also have a stability assay which heats the complexes up at 37 degrees and after 24 hours we measure the amount of complex present. And that's important because um, you know, it's not just whether the peptide binds in the groove because MHC class 2 that, that binding is quite transient. So to have a peptide which actually um, can be very stable in the, in the groove and is presenting to the T cell receptor for a significant amount of time is actually very important. So these assays can be used, again, to, to screen those peptides which have high stability. Um, this is just a, a list of all the different alleles that we have. <laughs> and this now is a, a kind of a combination of uh, the data that I've shown you before with the functional T cell assay. So this particular peptide, this is a peptide, remember, that I pointed to that had significant responses in the, the, the T cell proliferation assay. I'm just going to focus on this one Humira peptide uh, as an example of the detail that you can kind of zoom into. If we look at the five donors that responded, responded significantly with this one, to this one peptide, this is their HLA type here. So we have the DR1301, DR1501, which is DR2, DQ0602, 0603, DP0401, and 0201, etc. And the colors, the traffic lights, basically reflect how this particular peptide has bound in the binding assay. So green means that this particular peptide, SLY, bound very strongly to DR1. Yellow is it bound with intermediate affinity. Red is it didn't bind. And gray is it was not tested because the allele wasn't covered in our panel. Because in, our, in this particular assay, we can see that the binding observed was actually all related to DR1, sorry, was all related to the DR um, uh, family locus in this particular um, peptide. Generally for Humira we did see more of a DR skewing of binding. That, that's not the case for all proteins and actually for Remicade we found that a, a lot of the peptides actually were DQ restricted interestingly but for, for Humira it did seem to be more DR <coughs> restricted. 
Because with ProPresent, we were just looking at DR peptides, that the immunoprecipitation was carried out with an anti-HLA-DR uh, HLA antibody, I'm just going to hide the DQ and DP because we're not interested in those for the moment. So this is the, the, the summary of which peptides, sorry, this peptide and how they bound to these different HLA alleles. When we go back and actually have a look at the ProPresent data, this particular peptide, which is the, the full-length sequence identified through mass spec, we can see that the donors that came up positive were DR1 restricted. We have a few other alleles as well, so 1301, 1302, 0401, 0403, et cetera. Um, and the alleles that we predicted to bind were DR1, 1302, 0401, and 0301. And what we can see here is that actually that correlates very nicely. So DR1, in this case, the peptide bound strongly in the physical assays, and obviously we identified it, and it was functional. Um, 0301, although it was an intermediate binder, clearly it was naturally presented as well and was able to bind, and that was something else which we were um, able to see in this particular donor here. So, um, in short, what this allows you to do, which obviously goes into a lot of detail, is to um, take information which potentially can be very patient-specific and identify a whole suite of different epitopes which you could potentially then use to track immune responses in patients. Ultimately, it's a kind of a question of, of how you're going to use that information if you want to go down to that level, because you, also, you would need access to patients to, to be able to do that, um, and then to be able to understand how that really correlated to what was going on. But I think that's really our next stage, is to um, determine precisely how this level of information, which is now clearly available, can actually be deployed in, in the clinical setting. So by integrating these assays, uh, uh, I should point out, of course, that was just looking at one peptide. If you're looking at a very large number of sequences, it's obviously there's a lot of information. But the key thing is that these assays can be integrated very quickly, and um, in just eight weeks, this whole panel of work was carried out. It allows us to, of course, in great detail, characterize epitopes of any protein therapeutic, um, and potentially that information can then be used to uh, monitor immune responses post-administration. It can help us provide more data to regulatory agencies, and also sort of feed into this quality by design strategy that we were discussing earlier to really make the most about what we expect to happen in the clinical scenario, which of course is quite difficult to ultimately predict. The dendritic cell T cell assays, I also wanted to kind of bring up, um, as Bonnie's mentioned them. So this is um, a, a, a panel of um, donors, again, which is selected from our biobank, which are HLA typed, and we get a broad HLA distribution. Again, the dendritic cells are generated from monocytes, and we then we load it with a protein of interest that's provided by the client. Now, we typically use a number of set positive controls, which are really assay controls, like KLH and tuberculin PPD. Um, they are just assay controls, and it is important to benchmark the results against um, maybe other internal proteins that you're working with, or at least proteins that you have a, a good understanding of. But uh, as we've discussed, there was, it's a quite a difficult question because really what that control should be is up for discussion. <laughs> um, but one of the nice things about this assay is that it does tell you the relative antigenicity of different drug candidates compared directly in the same assay against the same donors. So you can take protein 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, up to about 15, 20 proteins really can be um, simultaneously characterized in this assay. And that also means that we can analyze them at different concentrations, et cetera, as, as Nick mentioned. The donor, donor assay interference that may be affected by um, the target of your molecule is also um, kind of got around in this particular assay, depending on the, obviously what the target is. But it, it, it can be quite helpful to process these cells internally. If it's an anti-T cell antibody, for example, the, the dendritic cells are loaded with thera the, the therapeutic. And then once the peptides from that therapeutic are naturally processed and presented, then those dendritic cells are then um, incubated with, with T cells from the same donor. So again, what we do is we take dendritic cells, and then from the same donor we generate, um, uh, we, we, we isolate the CD4 positive T cells, and we do this co-incubation and measure T cell proliferation as a readout. Um, in some respects, this data is a little bit pointless because it, it's really looking at a number of therapeutics of quite different targets. Um, although Humira and Remicade is, is the same target. But when you're looking at this, it's quite difficult to know <laughs> what really what does it mean. Um, in the normal context, you'd be looking typically at proteins that have the same target or the same mode of action. And we would, um, 
what you can do is, is, as I say, benchmark them against each other. So in this case, what we can see is that Remicade uh, against, um, when you compare it to the other drugs we looked at, Campath, Avastin, Humira, um, really gives the strongest uh, response in these dendritic cell T cell assays. And one of the things to point out with these, the DCT cell assay is that it allows you to have a very um, uh, clear understanding of the sensitive nature of these assays. So with the PBMC assays, we typically look at which donors are responding significantly. With the dendritic cell T cell assays, not only do we look at which donors are responding significantly, but we also incorporate the strength of that response because the dynamic range of these assays is actually quite strong compared to the PBMC assays because you've got really pumped up dendritic cells in there, so you can really get some quite strong responses. So Remicade comes out very strongly here, um, and Humira relatively low. Great. Um, Campath, interestingly, which we know induces very strong um, immunogenicity, is actually pretty, pretty weak on this index. And our hypothesis for that is such because um, we believe that the immunogenicity of Campath is really driven by its mode of action rather than the um, T cell epitope content. So these assays are really measuring T cell epitope content. They're not measuring anything else. And um, with Campath, its inherent T cell antigenicity is actually seems to be quite low. It's really because it induces quite a range of different things like cytokine in, in storms and cytokine induction, which, uh, uh, which, which is part of the reason why it's, uh, it's highly immunogenic. So that's how dendritic cell T cell assays can be deployed. And then finally, it's going to touch on our Prairie Ultra technology. So Prairie Ultra is, a, if you can visualize an ELISA, it's basically doing an ELISA on a chip. And why would you want to do that? Well, basically, um, it allows you to use very small quantities of, of sample. So one application of this, I'll, I'll go through at a moment, may be to identify the specificity of anti-drug antibodies. Um, but before we get to that, let me talk about the actual platform. So it, it's a combined protein and peptide microarray. Um, microarray technology and peptides haven't had a happy history, it's probably, it's probably fair to say. And um, one of the issues with that is that peptides bound onto microarrays can uh, have given quite high background levels and it's been quite difficult to really quantify some of these issues relating to it. But what we've done at ProImmune is identify a, a technology which allows these peptides to be tethered to the slide in a much more physiologically relevant way. So that the, the peptides are able to interact with antibodies, whether that's serum, whether that's monoclonals or polyclonal antibodies, and, um, but in a very high throughput uh, and sensitive way. So it actually exceeds the signal quality and performance of optimized DCL ELISAs. So in a sense, there's kind of no reason to kind of do an ELISA when you can really use uh, and take advantage of this high throughput um, scale. So we can work with monoclonals, polyclonal serum of all different species and types. Wherever there's a detection antibody we can use in this, um, it can be deployed. We can also look at different isotypes as well, so it's not just IgG as well. So the key applications for Pro Ray Ultra um, are, for example, determination of the specificity of ADAs, we can map monoclonal binding sites. So if you're developing new monoclonal therapies, um, we can actually identify exactly where, th where they're binding. And of course, we can look at serum. And one of the nice things is, as immunologists, over years and years and years, we've got freezers full of serum, which you're wondering when on earth we were going to use and, and look at them, um, because we, they're very precious. So we don't want to thaw them out until we can really justify it. And the nice thing about this technology is that we, we need literally a microliter of serum. So the difficulty is more shipping a microliter rather than actually getting it out of the freezer. Um, so here you can actually probe historic banked samples um, or maybe pediatric samples where volume is quite an issue. You can even, in the context of vaccine development, look at disease versus convalescent samples to um, maybe understand, improve our understanding of vaccine design. And of course, in the context of immunogenicity, we can then map the, the ADAs as well. And I'm sure there are many other applications as well which we can discuss. Um, one of the things also that's quite interesting is maybe to consider things like epitope um, spreading and actually how um, maybe a, an individual who has high ADAs may be directing that towards a particular epitope, but actually over time that may change and you know, what does that actually, what are the implications of that too? So I've mentioned it's very sensitive. Here's just some numbers comparing it to ELISA. So the dynamic range of ProRay Ultra is uh, two and a half logs, comparing it to one to two logs for ELISA. Um, the sensitivity is half a nanogram per mil, and we have a less than 10% CV range at high signal level. The really nice thing that kind of, I think, gets into people's minds is how useful this is, is that we can just work with a, a microliter of serum. So it really is very, um, a very low requirement of material. And we can print 
more than 30,000 individual analytes on a single chip. When I say analytes, that can be peptides. So if you wanted to, you could print an entire proteome on the, on the chip. Although the majority of these projects that we do for clients tend to be um, in the range of hundreds of peptides. But the capacity is there for more than 30,000. We can immobilize protein or peptides. So if you want to look at conformational B cell epitopes, we can put and print down the target protein in its entirety, as well as the overlapping peptides as well. And the, the arrays themselves are very flexible. So actually, you can have a single array, or you can have up to 24 subarrays. And to visualize that, I've just got a, a cartoon again. So if you had one array, you could actually have 12,733 peptides in triplicate, or 6,000 odd in sextuplicate, going up to the 24 subarray, which is probably most popular, um, which means you can have uh, 293 peptides in triplicate in 24 subarrays. And this means, of course, you could, whatever combination you want to look at, you could have um, three samples analyzed at eight different titrations, eight concentrations, all on a single chip. So it's very, very, um, very, very fast to get a large amount of data. <laughs> and this is carried out as a service by ProImmune. So we would typically provide you with, um, uh, you would send us the, the, any samples for analysis. We would print the peptides and any proteins that you provide to us on the chips. And then we would carry out the analysis and then provide you with a report or um, the raw data, depending on the options that you require. And just to show you some data from that before I wrap up, is um, a case study looking at um, hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, okay, it's not immunogenicity, but I think it uh, kind of shows the point as to how this can be deployed. So here we um, basically analyzed, uh, this is just serum samples from three vaccinated individuals receiving a prophylactic vaccine. And our design strategy is 15 mepeptides overlapping by, um, in this case, 11 amino, sorry, uh, overlapping by 10 amino acids, so offset by five. So the peptides are then printed onto the, uh, onto the arrays. And here, when we look at the three different um, donors that we are analyzed, at a single, in this case, a, a 1 in 200 dilution, as we, we go across the peptides on the x-axis, we can identify epitopes which are common across all three, um, three donors that are responding to this particular vaccine. If we look at that particular strong peptide response and we look at all the different serum, again, we can see how that correlates with the different sera that we're measuring. So this is um, serum A, and in red is B, and in, in green is, is C. So again, you can actually identify the sort of response level across the linear, um, the linear response across different, different donors. And then also, when you're looking at um, the, the responses across different donors, you can get a feel for what epitope spreading is going on. Well, I, I suppose spreading is more of a dynamic process. In this case, I'm looking about at a, at a single point in these donors as to exactly what epitopes they're recognizing. So donor A is recognizing this particular stretch over here, whereas donor C is recognizing these peptides at the bottom. And in fact, all donors are recognizing these sequences in the middle. So it kind of gets a feel for exactly what's going on with, with different, um, different donors and exactly which sequences they're recognizing. So it can be used to look at serum or indeed mapping um, monoclonal antibodies as well. Yeah, so just to, to summarize, there are many tools available to look at different questions relating to immunogenicity, of course. And no one tool will be perfect and answer all your questions. In fact, even every individual tool, of course, has its own drawbacks. But going forward, I think an integrated approach to um, addressing key questions, which every different person we work with has a slightly different question, of course, and that's only the way it would, that you would expect it to be. And so we tailor the solution according to the, uh, our customers' needs. Um, so maybe that you're interested particularly in understanding natural antigen processing. Maybe that's a kind of a key, a key aspect to what you need to know. Well, in that case, the dendritic cell T cell assay to measure T cell function is going to be important. And also the antigen presentation assay, of course, to see which peptides are, are actually naturally processed and presented. Um, if you want to identify individual T cell epitopes, which the majority of customers that we work with aren't necessarily in that position. They're more interested in getting a, an overall feel of is compound, is, is my lead A versus lead C more immunogenic or less immunogenic when you come to these T cell epitope content. You don't actually need to know what those individual epitopes actually are. But if you did, then the binding assay, the T cell assay, and the antigen presentation assay can all be helped, helpful in that situation. So again, depending on what kind of questions you have, we hopefully have a tool which can really address that. And partly, I guess, why we're hosting this meeting is that it's really important for us to know what key questions people have. And when we had our meeting last year, in the discussion 
um, in the discussions that we've had in our forums, it was really very helpful just to understand what are the key things that people are struggling with and the biggest challenges that are being faced. Because through that information, it's our desire to try and you know, provide those tools that, that people really want. So I shall leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions.